All right, chapter 11, section 5, Volumes of Pyramids. This is the second family of polyhedrons that we discussed in section 4. Again, a polyhedron is simply a mini-faced three-dimensional figure where polygons are on every side. In section 4, we talked about the first family being prisms. Uh, some of my students think of them as tubes. Okay, Basically, you have some polygon base, a perfectly congruent polygon base above it, and then rectangles are on each of those sides that connect those two bases together, like a tube, like what you would use with Play-Doh or something like that. Okay, that's a prism. Uh, some of my students think of them as crystals and stuff like that. Whatever works for you. A pyramid, on the flip side of the coin, has a single base. And then it has triangles on each of those sides that will meet at some point above that base. So th these were the two families of the polyhedrons that we talked about. And if you recall from section four, we learned that the volume of a prism or a cylinder for that matter, a cylinder is basically just the circular base version of a prism. Uh, in both those cases, the volume or the space inside, the three-dimensional measurement of those shapes uh, broke down to the formula of volume equaling the area of the base, capital B, times the height or altitude of or depth of that prism or cylinder. That was section four. And you will notice that this formula for the volume of a pyramid is actually very, very close. We'll see the capital B for the area of the base. So it's still going to be important to identify the base, which in my opinion in a pyramid is a little bit easier to do. It's just the side that's opposite whatever tip-top point you have. That will be the base. So I need to identify the shape of that. And then the formula for whatever the area of that base is will depend on the type of shape that you have. Triangles will be one half base times height for that shape. Uh, rectangles will be length times width. Squares will be that square, that, that side length squared. Um, trapezoids, one half base one plus base two times the, the width. Um, and then like you get into like the complicated uh, polygons, like pentagons, hexagons and stuff where you have one half times apothem length times number of sides times side length, um, that sort of thing. Uh, for the record, in your final exam, I will tell you that if you get a problem like this, your base is going to be one of the simpler polygons, like a triangle or a, uh, a quadrilateral. Okay, So I'll make sure I give you that information as we go along. But back to the formula. Again, you'll notice this looks almost exactly like section four with one new addition. This guy out in front, one third. This one third is important because fundamentally, this is going to make this base times height, the height again being the altitude, of my, my pyramid, whatever that may be. Um, this base times height, which was just the formula from section four, one third is fundamentally going to make it smaller. So why would a pyramid have less volume than a prism with the same area base and the same height? The reason why is because if you were to imagine this same kind of square base for a prism, a prism would require that it have some square base, congruent square base above it. Even if it was the same height above it, so if we imagine the second base right here, that then would have rectangles that go down on all the sides, you could tell immediately that that would have more volume to it than this pyramid. Because it'd be like I took that prism and then collapsed all the sides to some point on the inside of that prism. So it makes sense that this one third should be making that volume smaller, okay? Even if that was a little abstract, uh, fundamentally, this is just one more formula to, to understand. Section four boiled down to area of the base times the height or altitude. This one's gonna boil down to the same area of the base times the altitude, but then I'm going to cut it into a third. Just a brief note right here, common mistake that students make. Um, for whatever reason, students like to ignore the fact that there's a fraction and then immediately convert it to a decimal. And they would be like, oh, one third is 0.33. Well, no, 0.33 is an approximation of one third. One third is actually 0.3333333 off for forever. So anytime you approximate this guy into a decimal, you are fundamentally going to have an error. Okay. But a quick way to deal with this is that anytime I multiply something by a third, that's the same exact thing as just dividing by three. 
So actually, on a calculator, this is actually a very simple thing to deal with. Simply find the area of your base, multiply it by its altitude, and then divide that value by three. That's the same thing as multiplying by a third. Okay. Uh, so that's just a brief note I want to make on that. Uh, we'll see that applied here in this next example. One last thing to talk about right here. Uh, I, I showed this in section four as well. You'll notice I drew two different versions of, um, of these pyramids. One has a slanted or tilted aspect to it. Uh, just like in section four, I'm really only caring about like the vertical height of this thing. So if it is slanted, I don't care how far it's slanted. It could go way off the page off over here. All I'm going to really care about is its vertical height. So if I imagine the base of this pyramid resting on my desk in front of me, I'm only caring about how vertically tall it goes. That will end up being that H value that we see here, just like we dealt with in section four. Okay, again, punchline. The one thing to be aware of is that ultimately, whatever the base times height are, I'm going to divide that by three, which is the same thing as multiplying by a third. Let's apply that in an example here. So just breaking down what we're seeing in this diagram, how to interpret the information. Really, the first and foremost thing to be able to identify is the base. Okay, because whatever the base is, I'm going to find the area of that shape, whatever shape it may be. And then I'm going to multiply it by the altitude of this pyramid. So in this diagram, we can see quite obviously here that I have a triangle base. So actually the name of this pyramid would be a triangular pyramid, okay? And so this base is not just a triangle, but it also is a right triangle as shown by this kind of janky little box right here, right? This is a right triangle base that ends up being significant because the formula for the area of a triangle is one half base times height. And in that triangle, the base and height have to be perpendicular to one another. Okay. And that's important because that means that in this base triangle right here, the four and the six are simply those base and height. It'll make the calculation really fast and simple. So just to talk through it really briefly, we'll do it here in algebra in just a second. If I was just focusing on the area of this triangle on the base, I'd do one half times four times six. Okay. Uh, whichever order you do that in, that end up being the area of the base, which will be our capital B in that volume formula. The height, what you'll notice, particularly with pyramids, this will be a requirement. You're going to start noticing these kind of things in your diagrams, this little segment here with, the, again, another perpendicular box right there. This is representing vertical height. Okay, It's not a side to the pyramid or anything like that. Uh, some, most often it'll be shown in a different color or a dotted line or whatever. But this piece right here is representing the vertical height of the pyramid. So that nine centimeters in this diagram is going to be that H in our volume formula. Well, in this problem that just then fills up all of our pieces that we need to plug into our formula. Okay. So at this point, it's just about plugging it in and doing the calculator work. So let me jump to the whiteboard. Again, our formula for the volume of a pyramid, it will be easy to identify them as you come across them. Pyramids rather uh, is going to be one third the area of the base times the height. Using my section four technique right now, where I'm going to replace this capital B with whatever shape base I'm dealing with. This one was a triangle. So technically speaking, the volume here is going to be one third of the base area, which is calculated by one half lowercase b base times height. This again, these had to be perpendicular to each other in a triangle. You've done these sorts of things before in previous math classes. I'll trust that you're familiar with that. And then all this is multiplied by this other H. Don't confuse two H's. This is, I usually think of this as the depth or altitude of my three-dimensional object, which was the nine centimeters in the diagram. So I just plug the numbers in. Okay, one third times and then one half of the base and the height. The base and the height, it does not matter which one goes where, four and six. Uh, I'll just put them in that order. Four centimeters and six centimeters were the uh, both of the base and height, respectively, of that base triangle. And then the altitude, the depth, the height of the pyramid, the three-dimensional height, was nine centimeters. This string multiplication can intimidate students. So let me just kind of break it down um, into the fact that I have technically two fractions multiplied by each other and then a series of whole numbers or decimals, however you want to think of them as, um, I kind of treat them separately. So I'll just do them two separately. So let me do four times six 
is 24. And I'm going to multiply that result by 9. There are my three numbers multiplied together, 216. I have two fractions to multiply together. Um, when you multiply fractions together, you go numerator to numerator, denominator to denominator. So 1 times 1 is 1. 3 times 2 is 6. 1 third times 1 half is 1 sixth. All that did was just break down my two different pieces of multiplication right here, 1 sixth and 2 sixteen. At this point, again, here's where students tend to get intimidated. They see a fraction. They're like, oh, my God, what do I do? Um, again, technically speaking, anytime I multiply by 1 over something in a fraction form, this is just as simple as saying it's that number divided by that number. Okay. Uh, I guess to just break it down, technically this is over 1, as all whole numbers are over 1. So this is the same thing as saying 216 divided by 6. Pretty quick and easy. Do it in your calculator, and you would find that the volume here is 36 cubic units. The units here were in centimeters, and that would be cubed for the volumetric three-dimensional measurement. This piece right here would be given to you in big ideas. You would just have to be solving for this number. So this will end up being our volume. So that's an applied example here, pretty straightforward, particularly in this case where I just had to plug in those three numbers. Um, in this next clip that we do, we're going to see where we, we are actually given the volume measurement and we have to solve for one of these pieces. Um, in, th in those cases, instead of just doing the explicit operations, since these were all on the same side of the equation, I just had to do the string multiplication as it was written. If I'm solving for something over here, then I'm fundamentally having to move stuff to the other side of the equation. And we'll see in the next clip, that's just going to involve some inverse operations that you'll be familiar with as well. But that will conclude our first clip. I'll go ahead and stop the recording right there.